Good morning and welcome. I'm glad you're worshiping with us at First Methodist Waco today. We hope and pray that you meet God's presence during this time and that you are filled with his spirit. Let us worship the Lord together. My Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. My comfort, my shelter, tower of refuge and strength, let every breath, all that Never cease to worship you. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the your hand forever I'll love you forever I'll stand nothing compares to the promise I have let the me. king of my heart be the mountain where I run the fountain I drink from oh he is my song let the king of my heart be the shadow where I the ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Let the king of my heart be the wind inside my sail, the anchor in the waves, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my Inside my veins, the echo of my days, oh, he is my song. You are good, good, oh, you are good, good, oh. Shout to the Lord, all the earth, let us sing. Power and majesty, praise to the King. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar at the sound of your name. I sing for joy at the work of your hands. Forever I'll love you, forever I'll stand. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have. Nothing compares to the promise I have in you. Church, I want to thank you for your extraordinary generosity during these unprecedented times. And I want to encourage you, if you continue to have an income, to give God thanks for that during this season by supporting the ministries of Jesus Christ at First Methodist Waco. For those of you who have lost your income source, God certainly does not expect you to give, but hear me, if you have needs, the church wants to help you meet them. The reason we can do that is because those of us who have been blessed to continue to have an income, 
are willing to give God thanks in a tangible way by sharing the generous things that he's given to us uh, with the church and those who have need. Again, thank you for your generosity, and I pray that you will continue to give God thanks by sharing with what he has shared with you. Hey church, we are coming to you today from our downtown campus, and I'm actually in the balcony today, and that's for a reason, I'm gonna tell you about it. Um, one of the things that we know is that life, life right now is, uh, we are inundated with a story that is being told over us and over our lives. We have fear, we have loneliness, we have despair that seems to be setting in as things are just so difficult. There's a lot of ambiguity around life. Uh, when are we gonna be done with sheltering in place? When are we gonna be able to get back to life? As normal. One of the things that we know, though, is that Jesus always looks at the world differently. He always has a different perspective to give to us, and he wants to speak into our lives as the church. You know, right now, I know that many of you are graduating from high school and college, and you're not able to celebrate the way that you would like to with your family. I know that for a lot of people, the children are being born, and we're not able to gather the family together for that either. Weddings are being moved. The way that we are worshiping right now has even changed. And so one of the things that we come to you today is saying this, Jesus has something to say over every situation, whether it's a difficulty, whether it's a joy and a celebration, he has something to say to us right here and right now. You know, one of the things that Jesus also does is he often inserts mercy and grace into the most difficult of situations. He adds value and meaning to, to places in our lives where there's great questions um, overarching questions for us. So today I'm going to bring to you a message from Mark chapter 2. Uh, Jesus is confronted by the Pharisees, and whenever he's confronted by them, he begins to tell a different story. This is the way it reads. In Mark chapter 2, starting in verse 23. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? So essentially what Jesus and his disciples are doing is they're walking through a grain field on a, on a Sabbath morning and they're letting their fingers pass through the grain. And as they pass through the grain, they're plucking some of the heads of wheat. They begin to shuck it in their hands and then they begin to eat it. I imagine it tastes like really gross grape nuts. Um, I don't know if you like that cereal or not, but that's what I imagine this to taste like. Well, they're not eating a feast, they're not preparing a great meal, but in this Sabbath day, there is a group of Pharisees that are uh, confronting the disciples and Jesus in this moment. And what they do is they come and say, I can't believe you would violate the Sabbath like this. Now, Jesus and his disciples were actually within their rights, within Mosaic law. The book of Deuteronomy and the book of Levit Leviticus tell us this is okay. But at this moment in history, the Pharisees are valuing ceremonial law above human life and above mercy. And Jesus speaks into that and actually against that because he wants his disciples and he wants others to know that God loves his people. And so what happens next is this. Jesus in verse 25 says, have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? And in need. In the days of Abiathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. And he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even over the Sabbath. You know what Jesus is doing here is he is bringing human dignity and life right up into the middle of the story. He's actually telling the disciples, you don't need to worry about this confrontation. You see, for the disciples in this moment, they're thinking stuff like, oh man, we are busted. That's the technical term for this, busted. They're caught red-handed. There's, there's no getting away from this. They were eating and preparing a meal on the Sabbath. As small as it was, it was still a violation and the Pharisees confronted them. But what Jesus does is he asks a pointed question. And this question changes the conversation. It changes the temperature in the area completely because all of a sudden Jesus is now in charge of the conversation. You see, what he does is he draws on this story 
that not just the Pharisees would know, but everyone would know. Why? Because everyone knew the stories of David. He was a national hero. He was the one that everyone talked about. The stories were told in childhood nurseries at the time. And so whenever, whenever David's stories were told, they were lifted up and they were celebrated. And see, David's stories were known by the Pharisees, of course, but they were also known by the disciples, the uneducated men that stood with Jesus. You see, the reason this is important is because when David ate the consecrated bread, this is also a really important story for the life of the church today, too. You see, what happened is that David was on the run from King Saul. The king decided he wanted to kill David. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 21, the story is told this way. David goes to Nob, a town where there is a shrine in place. And whenever he goes to this place where priests were worshiping and setting up altars to pray, he knew there would be food. And so as he's on the run and he makes his way to Nob, he goes into the place where the priests were and he's greeted by Ahimelech. And Ahimelech says, David, how can I help you? You're a national treasure. You're a national hero. What can I do for you? And David says, I need food. So Ahimelech is in a difficult position because he says, well, the only food that we have here is consecrated bread, bread that is set aside for worship purposes and really for the consumption of priests. And David assures him that he is on uh, God's business, holy business, business on behalf of the king. Uh, it's not really true, but he tells Ahimelech this. And Ahimelech says, have you kept yourself clean? Have you and your friends been good boys as, as you're out on the uh, out in the wilderness? He says, yes, we've been, we've been good. He says, okay, I'm going to give you the bread to eat. Now, the other part of this that's really fascinating is not just David being given the bread, but also who he shares it with. Remember that Jesus tells us that he shares it with his companions. Well, who are his companions? Well, I'm glad you asked. In 1 Chronicles chapter 11, we get to learn about the ones that are with David. We're told they are mighty warriors, that they are his mighty men. These are men that have gone out to the wilderness to live as well. Uh, they were shunned from society. They had no place of belonging, and yet they group up with the anointed king of Israel. And they actually help him establish his kingdom. They stay with him. They're faithful. This is what 1 Chronicles chapter 11, verse 10 says. These were the chiefs of David's mighty warriors. They, together with all of Israel, gave his kingship strong support to extend it over the whole land. As the Lord had promised, this is the list of David's mighty warriors. Jashobim the Hakmonite was chief of the officers. You see, if you were a mighty man, you had to have a cool name. You had to be from a cool town as well. So Jashobim, the Hakmonite, he raised his spear against 300 men whom he killed in one encounter. This is epic language. This is a story of great exploit. This is a story that every person knew. Next to him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ahohite, one of the three mighty warriors. He was with David at Pasdamim when the Philistines gathered there for battle at a place where there was a field full of barley, the troops fled from the Philistines, but they took their stand in the middle of the field and they defended it and struck the Philistines down and the Lord brought about a great victory. The next story that's told here is whenever David expresses to his mighty warriors, he says, I'm so thirsty and I want a drink of water. There's this well in Bethlehem, but it's it's held in a Philistine garrison. The Philistines were, 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 um, had, they had set up a, an army base in this area at the time. And so one of the things that happens is that there's a, there's a Philistine garrison in place in Bethlehem. And David says, I just want to drink of water from that well. He's kind of talking extemporaneously. And these men bust through the garrison. They draw up water in the midst of the Philistine camp and they bring it back to David. This is the people that David spent time with. The last one I want to tell you about takes place in verse 22. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, a valiant fighter from Kabzeel, performed great exploits. He struck down Moab's two mightiest warriors. He also went down into a pit on a snowy day 
and he killed a lion. Now listen, we all know killing lions is much harder when there's snow on the ground. The point of all of this is not to lift up these warriors and their great exploits. It's to remember that Jesus is drawing on this story for a reason. You see, what happens is that whenever the Pharisees come and confront he and his disciples on this issue of breaking the Sabbath, Jesus pushes back and says, do you know the story of David when he ate the consecrated bread and he shared it with his companions, the mighty warriors, the mighty men? Well, what Jesus is doing is he's adding a different look at the story that he's in. You know, they're experiencing shame and dejection and embarrassment, thinking, oh man, our dad's going to kill us. And all of a sudden, they begin to shift their focus, the disciples do, to, well, hold on a minute. Does this mean that we are Jesus' mighty ones? That we are his mighty men? What Jesus is saying is these guys that are with me, these are my boys. And when I am with them and they are with me, they're good. All of a sudden, Peter and Andrew, John and James and the others, they begin to probably stand up a little straighter thinking, hey, I could kill a lion if I needed to. The point is this. Jesus ascribes mercy and human value to every person that, that expresses trust and love in his name. And so one of the things that we are called to do in this moment is to remember who we are as the church. We're called to remember whose we are, that when Christ is with us, that we are stronger than we ever could imagine. You see, Jesus is the author and the perfecter of our faith. He is the one that offers redemption and restoration. So even in the most difficult times, Jesus is wanting to speak and tell a different story over our hearts and over our lives. He's wanting in this very moment, in this moment of ambiguity, this moment of confusion, wondering uh, when things are going to change, when, wondering when the economy is going to come back and bounce back, wondering when jobs are going to return and when we can begin to spend time with loved ones. One of the things that Jesus wants us to know is that we are never alone, that he never leaves us, that he never, he never um, forsakes us. He never, he never takes his eye off of his loved ones. And so in this season, right here, right now, Jesus is wanting to remind you, you're stronger than you know. He is with you. He hasn't left. He hasn't abandoned. And he wants to speak a different story over your life, one of redemption and restoration. He wants you to know that he is one, that you are one of his mighty ones and to live into that promise. As so a church, we are called up. We're called to see Jesus for who he is. We're called to remember who he is. He's the, he's, he's the Lord of the Sabbath, yes, but he's the Lord of the cosmos. He gives us salvation and redemption. And as the church, we're called to live into that right here and right now. Amen? Amen. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you. Before I took a breath, when I doubted, Lord, remind me, I'm a wonderfully made. You're an artist and potter, I'm a canvas and clay. And you make all things work together for my future and for my good. And you make all things work together for your glory and for beyond the clouds though we've walked through fire I see clearly now I know nothing has been wasted no failure or mistake you're an artist and a potter I'm a canvas and a clay you make all things work together 
In 1953, there was a tornado that came through Waco, and this church building survived that. But in 1954, there was a fire that burnt it to the ground. There was nothing left. Well, actually, th this cross survived the fire. Um, it was the only thing that, that, that endured. Isn't that amazing? The cross endured. That and the people. The people endured. I know that we are in a season in which there are all sorts of um, extra challenges, uh, anxiety, situations that are hard right now and some things are falling away some things aren't happening that usually would be happening I know that it is the time of year that there would be graduations baccalaureate celebrations and 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 parties and gatherings people would toss their caps and stadiums filled with people and that is really different this year there's lots of rites of passages uh, things that that would be the end of one season and the beginning of a new one that aren't happening family gatherings that are put on hold special events, summer camps, gatherings that just, that just aren't happening this year. I don't know if you're struggling with that, but I've had a hard time with some of those things, and it is so important for us to name them and take them to the Lord. As Brandon was saying, God takes the things that, that we experience in this world and helps us see them with new eyes, from a new lens, to help us see that, that through it all, no matter what happens, we can endure when God is with us. Will you pray with me? 
Holy Lord, there are so many little disappointments, little losses, and some really big ones that our friends are experiencing in these days. And so we come to you and we place them in your hands. We ask that you would give us time and space to be sad for the things that aren't happening, but also that you would give us vision to see the ways that you are at work, for the ways that we can experience these days of life still filled with joy, knowing the power of your presence with us, seeing new opportunities to connect with friends or neighbors or with family. Lord, as you strip some things away in our lives, we see you more clearly. So we pray and we trust that your presence would remain the fiercest and strongest and most life-giving thing in our lives. Help us to see you. Lord, we offer you all of these things and we give you thanks for the way that you promise to meet us each day, for the love that you pour out to us and for the ways that you sustain us always. Hear our prayer together as we pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.